I'm back. Quick vacation is done. I have five games to talk about, and right now the hottest baseball player on the planet who just took home the American League Player of the Week, Jose Ramirez, to get to. We have some prospect talk, who's injured, who's getting promoted, who's dominating, as well on today's episode of Locked on Guardians. You are Locked on Guardians, your daily podcast on the Cleveland Guardians, part of the Locked on Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello, everyone. I am the host of Lockdown Guardians, your host, Jeff Ellis, formerly of Scout, formerly of 24 7, where I was a national prospect and draft analyst. And before that, I wrote at Indians Baseball and Indians Prospect Insider, focused on, well, the Cleveland Indians, now the Cleveland Guardians. Uh, And I've also appeared on pretty much every Cleveland sports blog imaginable at some point in time. Uh, I want to thank you for making Lockdown Guardians your first first listen today and every day, wherever it is that you get podcasts. So let's get into some prospect stuff off the top of it today. Uh, So Daniel Spino is finally coming back from knee tendonitis. He is supposed to be throwing, I think, yesterday. So hopefully we'll get some information on him. Gavin Williams and George Valera both left games last week due to injuries, but... (laughs) Man, that is an old tweet to pull up. Uh, doesn't appear that anything is major going on there. Uh, we did have some minor moves around the organization that I kind of missed out on uh, with me being you know, out and about and not around. Um, so we talked about the, the Will Brennan promotion. Uh, with that, Chris Roller, who was selected uh, two seasons ago in the minor league portion, portion of the Rule 5 draft, was activated. You know, they with the release of Anthony Alford, they had opened up one roster spot, so Roller gets to hop in and get that. Uh, and then on top of that, then we had a situation where uh, they moved Robert Broom. Man, remember when I talked about how he could be the greatest tenth round pick in franchise history, and I kind of put him in a tier with Kyle Nelson and and Nick Sandlin, honestly, at the time uh, back in 2019, was it? Uh, he got demoted to Akron. Rough time for him. Uh, they wanted to bump up Kevin Kelly, another one of those guys who've been talking about the fantastic relief arms in AA, guys who are really putting themselves on the map. He's another one of those guys. Uh, they also released Zach Draper. The lefty had been you know, the definition of an organizational soldier. But when you have Tanner Tully to do essentially the same role, but you know, maybe a little bit better stuff, a little bit better knowledge, uh, you know, it makes sense. So unfortunate for him. Uh, you hate to see anyone's career come to an end. He pitched anywhere whenever he was asked. Uh, speaking of top performers, uh, Will, Dian- Will Dion was named the Carolina League Pitcher of the Week. Ten innings pitch, three walks, 16 Ks. He leads the Carolina League in ERA, whip, and average against this year. ERA of 141, whip of 0.89, and average against of 0.180. How about Joey Cantillo? I said if there was a Rule 5 draft, the Guardians would lose him. I was very confident of that. Thank goodness there wasn't. Uh, if you missed it, the month of May, Cantillo didn't give up a run. Pitched 22 innings, zero runs. Uh, I believe he allowed five base runners. Uh, maybe it was six through that entire time while striking out 33. It was as impressive a run as you'll see. You know, Hunter Gaddis, who we had on the show, had a great run. His last start, he had a little bit of a hiccup. So when that occurred, I mean, it allowed Cantillo to really be the star of the month for the Cleveland Guardians in terms of prospecting. Uh, it's it's going to be interesting to see. They have a lot of fun arms. Who's going to get moved up? Uh, at what point? Who's going to get opportunities? But it is a it is a nice problem to have. That is for sure. You know, I mentioned that Jose Ramirez was the American League Player of the Week. How about the fact that the National League Player of the Week was Francisco Lindor? And he's been up and down this year, but what a performance by him over the past week. You have two Guardians. Well, one former Guardian, I guess. But still, you get my point. Out there. Uh, winning the Player of the Week award. Cleveland developed bats, winning both of those. My co-host wants to jump in. You, uh, Francisco Lindor, got your attention. What do you have to say, Nacho? Oh, you want to turn your back on Lindor. Apparently not a Lindor fan with him. Not happy about the whole exit. But we got Andres Jimenez out of it. Can't argue with that. Andres Jimenez, uh, Lindor is is better. I don't think that's really up for debate. He's been a little consistent, but he's a better player. But Andres Jimenez, that's that's right in and of itself. One year of Lindor for five of Jimenez, that's a that's a pretty good return on investment. 
let's get into these games, though. Let's let's go the other way. We've discussed some minor league players. We talked about uh, some of the top performers. Yeah, I guess top minor league performers and some transactions. So let's get into these games. Let's start with the first game I missed. Now, at this point in time, I was, what, four for four, and I got this game right as well. Bieber versus Fajardo. I said, you know, I'm kind of leaning. I, I don't know which way to go. What's crazy about this game is the Guardians gave up 10 hits to Detroit, and Detroit got one run on 10 hits. That is abysmal. That is one of the worst, like, I have seen in that area. They had 11 base runners. That should be closer to three runs to get one run. Guardians had uh, tw- 16 opportunities and got eight. That's fantastic. By the way, this is the, uh, what, the Saturday game, I believe, because the Friday game got rained out. You had Jose Ramirez with a double and a home run, Naylor with a double, Oscar Gonzalez with a, ho- a double, and Richie Palacios with a double. Who were our two first in this one? Who reached base twice in that game? Well, Jose Ramirez did it, Josh Naylor did it, Oscar Gonzalez did it, and Richie Palacios did it. Gonzalez has kind of been as advertised. <laughs> we'll get into the gaff later on in the show, but he's going to be have defensive issues. He's going to swing at ball four a lot. He is going to, it's going to be a roller coaster ride. We'll see how it goes for him. It is interesting. I know Detroit went out and traded for Tucker Barnhart, and I know Eric Haas is not playing particularly well, but with all their offensive struggles, and Harold Castro went three for four in this game, and he's been arguably their best hitter. I mean, everyone's struggling for them, uh, but, ca- you know, that they can't find a spot for Haas after the year he had last year on this team. I mean, everyone for Detroit is just not hitting the ball. Bieber in this one, eight innings, eight hits, one earned run, only five strikeouts. Again, still not the same Shane Bieber. Facing a really weak lineup helped him out in this one. Players of the three stars, well, Jose Ramirez, clearly. Shane Bieber as well, eight innings, one run is going to get you that. And I think at the end of the day, he gives the last one to, to Naylor, who had the two hits in the middle of the lineup. I don't think, oh, you know, Straw reached base three times, or three times, not just, you know, one time with the hit, but also had the two walks. But I'm still more, uh, you know, I think Naylor with the extra base hit uh, is the player who earned that. So that was, you know, and Fajardo, give credit to that kid who has worked his tail off to get to the big leagues. Uh, yes, I was high on him back in his I forgot to turn the other light on. Here comes some, some extra lighting in this show today. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I've been a fan of his for a while, so it's also a little bit self-serving. But it was not an easy or clear road for him, so I always appreciate those guys who work to get there. Detroit's a bullpen, much like their offense. Um, it has some bright spots, at least in the bullpen, but it's uh, it's still not very good. We're going to take our first break, come back. We've got four more games to talk about on today's episode of Locked On Guardians. It is always nice when a sponsor comes back, and that's what we have. We have the return of BlueNile.com. I've talked about them many times in the past. They do really interesting-looking jewelry. This is not things that are cookie-cutter or generic. This is timeless jewelry uh, that, you know, it's fine jewelry. It's also great wedding jewelry. Uh, it, it can do everything you want your jewelry to do uh, over at BlueNile.com. Now, I am not the most uh, knowledgeable of jewelry, but I will say, again, for someone like me who doesn't always know things, you want... I have always found something that is stands out while still being beautiful. Classy, but interesting, right? That's what you're looking for when you go out and spend money on jewelry. So right now, you want to make your moment sparkle with jewelry from BlueNow.com and Locked On Sports. Listeners get 50% off purchases of $500 or more. This podcast exclusive includes engagements. Use code Locked On. That's code Locked On. Plus, every order is insured, ships free, and arrives in discreet packaging that won't give away what's inside. Shop stress-free and find your forever piece. Go to BlueNile.com today. Listen, right now, I would like you to go. We have a survey, and with this survey, you can win one of 10 $100 gift cards to Ticketmaster. Uh, It's going to let us know more about the podcast and what you like about the podcast. It's also maybe a chance to let people know that you like the Lockdown Guardians podcast. I'd like you to go and fill out this survey right now. Go to lockedonpodcast.com slash survey. They say it is very quick. Everyone who enters has a chance at one of those $100 Ticketmaster gift cards. It's an opportunity to let us know what you like, what you don't like. You can go tell them you like Lockdown Guardians. I would very much appreciate that. So go check out that survey today. So I just talked for 10 minutes and then realized that uh, this was paused. <laughs> it was not recording. Uh, it was me ranting against the Royals. Um, I talked about the the last Tigers game, which was 
a ridiculous loss. Now, that was the one that ended my stretch where I had, what, five, six straight games in a row of predicting who was going to win or lose before the game began. And when you look at it, you're like, oh, E. Rodriguez, I can see why the Guardians lost this. <laughs> no, uh, it was Elvin, not Eduardo. And McKenzie was great. Seven and two thirds, four hits, two earned runs, uh, had one walk, struck out eight. The, the home runs, long ball came to get him. Uh, just a stellar performance overall. Who <laughs> reached base twice in this one? We had Owen Miller as a pinch hitter, and you had Luke Maley. They had five opportunities and got two runs. That's mind blowing. That is a very good amount. Uh, when you look at Cleveland, Cleveland had, what, seven, eight opportunities? I'm sorry, Kansas City actually had six opportunities. Two runs on six opportunities. That's okay. That's not a, a huge amount for Detroit. Cleveland had uh, eight opportunities and only got one run. That's a poor performance. They had no extra base hits. Uh, it was just a poorly played game, and one of those games you hate to watch because my co-host wants to hop back in. He did not enjoy this one either because it was a boring game. Uh, everyone looked kind of terrible in it. And they lost. They lost to a very bad team. You have to beat the bad ones. But that's that game. So we move on to, oh, three stars. McKenzie, Maley, and Owen Miller. There's not really too many other players to even consider. Yesterday's game, or I should say probably by the time you're listening, two days ago's game was, I mean, it was just silly. <laughs> uh, Zach Plesak with a great performance. Not what everyone is expecting. Trevor Stuffin continuing to scuffle. Nick Sandlin with one of the least effective effective outings I've ever seen. Uh, Jose Ramirez with having himself a day. Andres Jimenez getting to be the hero. A game you feel like, oh, they're going to lose this, and they come back and win it. Uh, it was, it, And I didn't even talk about Oscar Gonzalez's massive miscue. But let's get into Zach Plesak. So last time we pitched, I put out that whole headline, like, Plesak, anything but pleasing. And it led to some of my most negative responses ever that made me wonder if the Plesak family had watched the video. But I don't know if they watched the video, they would have understood that, yeah, that's a headline just to get people looking because I know people are frustrated because this podcast and myself in general might be the last bastion before this start of supporting Zach Plesak as a starter. I still think it's too early to give in. Yes, Kansas City is awful. They are atrocious. They are bad. Uh, so six innings, five hits, one earned run, five strikeouts. The strikeouts are the nice thing to see there. Uh, he pitched extremely well. You love that outing in this one for Zach Plesak. But, like, I have been the one defending him to the hilt. Yes, I went for the smarmy headline. But I still believe, like, I still don't think it's a huge separator between him and Aaron Zavale. Uh, I just don't. Like, at least Plesak is a little more healthy. Zavale, I think, has a little bit of a higher ceiling. But I think they're both fives. Uh, that's just the way it is. And people, would like, wanted to cut... Uh, I, please act. And I'm like, you don't cut pitching. You don't cut pitching. Pitching is the hardest thing to find. There's always value. I guarantee you, you could at least get something for Zach. Please act. Reached base twice in this one. Well, Miles Straw had two walks. He had two hits for Jose Ramirez. Two hits for Oscar Gonzalez. Andre Simenez had a hit and a walk uh, in this one. I think your three stars are Ramirez, Jimenez, and Please act. I don't really think that's up for debate. Eli Morgan hit 96. That's another... Black Magic, Cleveland Indians development. At this point in time, like, it hurts the bullpen if you take him out. But you got to find a way. Like, with the fastball is 96. Like, the big knock on, on Morgan, I, but we'll see. Like, maybe this is just a case where the fastball played up in the pen. Like, can he maintain it? If he can't maintain it, then you leave him in the bullpen absolutely and make him just a filthy weapon. A filthy, filthy weapon. Uh... <laughs> Gotta have some fun here. But if he can maintain it, if he can even maintain like 93, 94, he's a starter. Like he is a starter. You find a way to make that work with this team. I, Trevor Steffen, I really need to like sit there and break it down bit by bit. I, I have a feeling that he's just not as sharp. I mean, he's getting hit hard. He's just, they're picking up his stuff. I don't know if he's relying on certain pitches too much. I really need to just attack that data. But uh, okay, so Ramirez is the big hit. That is what, 13th home run of the year. And I was down. I was at a cookout. I'm sitting there, like, doing updates on my phone because I can't stream the game. And I'm like, oh, oh, great. And then I see Sandlin come in. I'm like, oh. And I see him walk the bases loaded and somehow get out of it. And I'm like, that, that, is the, that encapsulates his season right now. <laughs> I also don't know why you're going to him in that situation. Like, 
frustration. Sam Henches can get out more than lefties. Sam Henches can get out more than lefties. This is what I do with my students sometimes. Sam Henches can get out more than lefties. Let's try. Or let's use someone else and save Eli Morgan for some late inning roles. Like going to Sandlin in the eighth is a very poor decision. He got out of it this time. They were lucky. Sandlin should not be an eighth inning guy. With his control issues, he walked three. He walked three. His control is atrocious right now. He shouldn't be the guy you go to in that situation. I understand it worked out. Not the way to go. Andres Jimenez, just chef's kiss. I mean, he, what he has been this year to this team. Uh, you know, I, I know people like uh, when I was commenting about uh, not don't put a mod Rosario in the two hole because he's awful. People are like he's getting hot. He has not gotten hot. You notice I haven't mentioned him for these all of these games. Let's see. I, you know, today's game. Uh, I got to watch the very start of it. Let's see if, if he did anything in today's game. I didn't get to watch the whole thing because it happened right in the middle of, uh, of bedtime for the kiddo. But he put... Okay, so he did... Finally, we'd mention him. In one of the five games, he reached base twice. The rest of the series, he wasn't doing it. He wasn't getting on base. Uh, and then you put him in the... It, it, he had a two extra base hits as well. So, of course, uh, every time I go to crap talk him, I just got to crap talk him every game. That's apparently what I need to do. Uh, it just, it's frustrating that they leave him in the two hole. He should not be there. And I know the argument is if you move up Jimenez, you have no one at the bottom of your lineup. Who cares? What good is it with Jimenez when you got, you know, the black hole of left field and catcher after him? So he gets on base and gets stranded there. That doesn't do any good. If at least if he's hitting two, then he's setting up Jose and you got Jose, you know, you're setting up the middle of the lineup, at least that way you're getting something. Uh, putting him down there is like the last gasp. And then Ernie Clement is being overplayed. I know he had two hits in this one, but he is being overplayed. Uh, this is a little bit uh, ridiculous. Like, what are they going to do right now? I guess that's what it comes down to. Who are you going to promote? Who are you going to do? It, it's okay. But I, I hate this lineup, the way it is constructed right now. I hate Clement in front of him, and as I hate, I hate everything about this lineup today. Uh, but let's get back to yesterday's game. Uh, you know, we'll get into a little bit about the Friday game. Uh, we'll come back for segment three, Friday game. Get into the Tuesday game. We'll get into the absolute train wreck that is the Royals. Can we also talk about, though, going back before we do that? I guess I never really finished this game off. So Andres Jimenez with the huge home run in the eighth inning, I believe. After they gave up two runs, got the two runs to tie it, uh, he has a three-run shot. Just a great, great thing. We didn't even talk about the fact that Oscar Gonzalez can't count his outs, puts the ball into uh, the outfield, throws it to a fan. Uh, it's just that is very much an Oscar moment. That is just him not, you know, sometimes not being completely aware. He is, He's going to do things like that. He... he you know who what his ceiling could be? For good and bad, he could be Eddie Rosario. There might be some room for some comparison. Not maybe Eddie's arm, but there might be some room for a comparison between those two players. I'll have to really dig into the numbers, but maybe think about it. I, you can't argue with the performance since he's come up. He has been exactly the dude we expected. I, I don't believe there's been a walk. I don't believe there will be a lot walk in the month of June for him. So it's going to be all about hits. And he really hasn't had a lot of extra base hits so far. But uh, he's, he's earned this opportunity and he's performing well. Let's take that break, come back, talk about the game from Tuesday. And also just, I mean, take a minute and talk about this Royals team. Because whew, it's, I feel bad for Royals fans. Let's put it that way. I feel bad for Royals fans. And our sponsor, our good friends over at Bet Online. I've been spinning you some gold with Bet Online. Uh, in terms of being able to pick who's going to win these games. Now, I don't know about the lines and the like, but at least I'm giving you a good bit of information. Uh, and our partners at Bet Online continue to be the number one source for all of your betting needs and sports info. Find all the latest odds, news, and sports developments, including this year's basketball playoffs, Major League Baseball scores, fights, and even next season's NFL futures. Bet Online is your continued source for all of your sports wagering information, from live betting to playoffs, esports, and more. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. Bet online where the game starts. I want to thank you for making Lockdown Guardians your first listen today and every day, wherever you get podcasts. And go check out our good buddy Sully over on the flagship Locked On MLB podcast. Uh, before we get into the game, I did want to mention 
So Yu Chen Chang was essentially claimed by the pirates. A trade was worked out, cash to Cleveland. Cleveland's rolling in it, right? Like between Daniel Johnson and Yu Chen Chang. I mean, think of all that extra money that uh, that uh, Dolan's got. That he's just shoving. I'm kidding. Uh, these are normally pretty small cash deals on the whole. It is interesting because Yu Chen Chang's brother uh, was a Pirates prospect. I don't believe he is anymore. So he goes to the Pirates. Well, to make room for him on the roster, the Pirates have to cut Cole Tucker, whose brother is on Cleveland's roster. And I had someone be like, why didn't they just trade for Cole Tucker? Because Cleveland had to cut Yu Chen Chang to make room for Oscar Gonzalez. They have no room on the 40-man. They could try to work out a deal for Cole Tucker, but Cole Tucker would be an idiot to sign with the Guardians. An absolute fool <laughs> because of their infield depth. He should stay the heck away from Cleveland. They're, and Cleveland has no need for him. It's like... I, he's so he's he was given opportunities and could not I, they have been running out everything else at shortstop other than him uh it doesn't you know his he is very soon to be more n- famous for who he has dated than for his baseball career that's just the truth of the matter uh and if he would willingly come to, if cleveland signed him and he willingly claimed here he would be an absolute idiot like there's no other way around it you, you're not he just be block his future like, why? Why would you do that? This team has infielders for days. They have about six of them currently on the 40-man roster. Uh, but I just thought it was interesting that we traded him, so a guy who's in our system's brother got cut while the Pirates had previously cut the brother of the guy who we just traded to them. So just kind of some fun, random facts. Uh, let's talk about <laughs> today's game. So the Royals are hot trash, and I'm sorry to Royals fans because... Like, this is maybe the most botched rebuild I've ever seen. I'll say it again. They are in last place. And I want to say that twice because they've been in a rebuild for five years now, six years now. Uh, They've had a high pick almost every year, and they have almost nothing to show for it. When they let all of those guys go, they then sat there and proceeded to do the, hey, we're smarter than everyone else draft. We're going to draft the guys that a lot of people don't like, like Singer, like Kowar, like Lynch, like, uh, I was high on Chris Bubik. I thought that was the one that I rated highly there. I loved Kyle Isabel in the fourth round. But they have, you know, Frank Mezzichino last year, who I was the high man on him, and I had him in the 30s, and they took him at seven or eight or wherever it was. They keep drafting pitching, and they have no pitching to show for it. Uh, they're not, you know, they're sitting there running out. Like, I, I loved MJ Melendez as a draft pick. I thought he was great. Uh, I was a big fan of him. You know, Nicky Lopez have been higher on than the field. He's a really solid defender. The fact that Whit Merrifield is still on this roster is is a travesty. That, like, rather than do a full rebuild, because this is what I've talked about, right? Like, if you are a bad team, go see what it costs to get Jose for me, right? Because maybe you'll find something there, and giving him those at-bats is worthwhile. Because if you're a bad team that is three to four years out, I'd rather find a guy who, hey, if he works out, he's a trade value. He's an average defender up the middle, and if he can be a league average bat, that is incredibly valuable. Instead of giving a young guy an opportunity, instead of trying other players, they kept paying Whit Merrifield. When they could have sold him, sold, traded him, <laughs> sold is a connotation there is terrible, I apologize, but traded him when he had a ton of value. He had a fantastically team-friendly contract. He was an all-star who could play multiple positions, and then said, like, no, well, we don't want to do a complete rebuild. It's like you don't want to do a complete rebuild, but you're going to pick in the top five, like, four years in a row or something like that. It was just mind-boggling. Jorge Solar, they got nothing for because they waited too long. Like, after his big breakout year, I was on this podcast advocating that they should trade him immediately. Like, okay, he just hit 40 bombs and had one of the, was the best DH in the American League. Kansas City is five years away from being five years away. Go trade Zolar. Like, start building up your war chest. And you know, I talked about last year. People were talking about that pitching staff in Kansas City. I was like, Singer, Kowar, Lynch, Bubich. Uh, I mean, I like Dasa Lisi quite a bit, but I, he was, you know, there was some concerns there as well. Uh, I was like, the Detroit group is better. I was in the minority of that view, but that, that looks, I mean, that's not even up for debate anymore. This Kansas City rebuild has been so poorly handled. Um, Carlos Santana, I love Los. Love, love, love Los. One of my favorite players of my lifetime. He is. And over the last 10 years, he's one of, you know, might be my favorite. He has not had a runs created plus above 
100 since 2019. And it was in, uh, in 2020, it was a 99. They went out and overpaid him. I was on this very show saying, maybe he gets $4 million a year. Maybe he gets an invitee to camp. Because he's getting into his third. And instead, they went out and gave him a, is it a team option at the end of this year? I, <coughs> I don't know. But he has been one of the worst bats in baseball over the last two years playing first base. He's blocking Nick Prado. And you got Vinny Pascotino, who's been maybe the top hitter in all of minor league baseball in terms of performance. It's like, promote them both. You're wasting time. You're playing, you know, not good. Bobby Witt's starting to turn it around. Like I said, they, they missed their opportunity with Whit Merrifield. Salvi, they, I mean, they he would chase that home run record last year, and you're seeing the effects of it this year. Hunter Dozier's having a decent season. Uh, Kyle Isabella has been all right. After that, I mean, and then it's not a, a high-end minor league system anymore. They've promoted a lot of those guys, and a lot of the pitching in particular has fallen flat on their face. You know, I, I'm not sure. Do you have any confidence? Like, the, yes, they won a World Series, and flags fly forever, but how much of that was just not thanks to, you know, it was like they were the anti-analytic team. You know, the, from management and um, the front office down, and... The, this rebuild has been ugly. And you have to wonder, like, how much longer will they have? How much longer will they have? If they end up with the worst record in baseball at the end of this year, when they're supposed to be ascending, they have the worst record in baseball right now. They're supposed to be ascending. Uh, is Drayton Moore finally out? And I say finally because he probably should have been out a while ago because he mishandled this rebat, rebad, rebuild so badly. Not getting value for guys, not trading assets to help, you know, your rebuild. Being so strong in your belief that you know scouting better than others, that you're going to go against boards, you're going to go against conventional thought, you're going to go against what others are saying because, you know, and then also just being extremely rigid. Like, pitchers have to be this height. Pitchers have to do this. And then, I mean, the reports were when guys went there that the coaching was lackluster. Let's put it that way. Uh, yeah, that's why I feel bad. And Kansas City is in a place where, yeah, it's great that Cleveland just smacked them around, but they should because this might be the worst team in baseball. Paul Quantrell, six and a third innings, six hits, zero walks, five strikeouts, three earned runs. Uh, Henches, two thirds of an inning, one hit, one strikeout. Brian Shaw allowed two walks in his with the strikeout. Uh, and Yale De Los Santos, I mean, he's looking like a part of this pen going forward, multi hit in this one. Ahmed Rosario we talked about. Oscar Gonzalez had two more hits. Ernie Clement, Andres Jimenez, uh, reaching, you know, Jose Ramirez had one hit and uh, three walks. It was it was like they learned their lesson. Like, we're just not pitching to him anymore. Uh, Austin Hedges with a three-run home run. That's right. Austin Hedges had a three-run home run in this one. Uh, it was a total... I mean, from start to finish, a, a domination. Daniel Lynch, four innings, six earned runs. Uh, I also forgot that Jose Ramirez was intentionally walked twice by Lynch. So you get down to it, three, five times he was walked. Two of them, I mean, they were just like, okay, he's not, and he still had a hit. Still had a hit. He also had a bunch of hit-by-pitches. Uh, Quantrell hitting two guys and Miller getting hit once. Uh, so if I go back and look at it, uh, Miller actually reached base twice due to that hit pitch. Uh, what is our total opportunities? Well, Cleveland had 12 hits and four walks. That's 16. The two intentional walks takes them up to 18, and the hit batter is 19. Uh, eight runs on 19 opportunities is high, but it's not anything like crazy. Kansas City had seven hits, two walks, and two hit batters, so 11 opportunities. Three... <laughs> Three runs on 11 opportunities is, again, that's, you know, you're, you're looking at a, an average of, what, every three opportunities typically nets you a run. So, I mean, Cleveland's was high. Let me change that. Cleveland's was high. Kansas City's was not. Uh, and why did Cleveland get that? The, the three-run home run, a triple, and three doubles. They, I mean, Lynch got beat up. And, again, I mean, he's one of those players that was part of, central part of this Kansas City rebuild. And, you know, like, okay, so... Vinny Pascotino literally has nothing to prove in AAA. He needs to be added at the end of the year to your 40-man roster because he's Rule 5 eligible. Let's see what the kid can do. 
see what Nick Prado can do. Um, you know, I, I think Santana might have gone on the DL, but it's like Ryan O'Hearn. O'Hearn, no. Did he get released too? Maybe. If he didn't, he should have been. Like it just. Uh, it's it is mind blowing what they're doing with this team in a negative way, and I just like I said, I I feel I feel for Royals fans. That's where I am right now. I feel bad for Royals fans because this has been so poorly handled. Um, it, they don't didn't sell at the right high moments. They held on to players too long. They drafted and then can't develop. It's it's ugly. And like I said, worst record in baseball right now when they're supposed to be a team that is ascending. Uh, they still have tomorrow's matchup. We got Brad Keller versus Connor Pilkington. I mean, or yeah, so I'm like, probably advantage Brad Keller in this one. Keller has been uh, traditionally kind of like a four type, but I mean, I still, I wouldn't bet on Kansas City right now. Uh, it's They're just so bad that like, I would probably just be like, okay, this is a game I'm going to back off of. Uh, Keller is the type of junk ball guy that the Guardians sometimes have problems with. This is probably a game I, I don't, uh, don't partake in if that is your thing in terms of, of sports gambling, but it's just, it is, Kansas City is a really bad team, a poorly built team that has the worst record in baseball when like last year was supposed to be the first step forward. Um, and did they finish last in the division last year as well? Uh, I feel like, I don't know what would be the Twins. The Twins had that complete fall apart last year, right? Either way, Kansas City, I believe, still has a top five, top 10 pick next year or this year, and they're well on their way to one next year as well. So it's uh, brutal to be a Royals fan. Not a whole lot to root for outside of Bobby Wood Jr. Cleveland, we have the off day Thursday, which means tomorrow's show we'll discuss the game. Uh, We'll preview Baltimore maybe for Thursday, and then Friday's show we're going to go heavy on the draft. So tune in for that. I have been Jeff Ellis. This has been the Locked On Guardians podcast. Remember to rate and review, download daily. It all helps. Like and subscribe on YouTube as well. We're up into the, I don't know, almost 250. Let's let's get over 300. I appreciate all everyone does to help uh, this show with it is overall success. I have been Jeff Ellis. You can follow me on Twitter at Jeff MLB Draft. And as I end every show now, go, go, Guardians, go.